Hello and welcome to Bringing Education Home. I'm Herb and I'm Christina and together we bring ideas for families to grow stronger and healthier and happier that are both inside and outside the box. If you like the show be sure to follow Christina on Facebook and please leave us a like review or comment on your favorite podcast platform. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Siris Raquel Rivas Verdejo owner of Empowering Light Language LLC. She works with busy individuals and families to improve their communication and self-care, facilitated by a greater connection with their bodies and powered by a greater awareness of how their language impacts their lives. She is a family child coach, body relationship coach, speech language pathologist, learning behavior specialist, feeding therapist, and therapeutic energy worker. She infuses energetic techniques, cutting edge psychology, and results driven empowering tools and strategies into her coaching, private sessions, classes, and workshops. After more than 17 years of working with individuals, families, schools, and clinics, she has developed a poignant, dynamic, and unique approach that honors the little girl she was, who always knew more was possible for those who are different, magical, and a gift to the world. She is the host of Choosing a Different Future podcast and lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome, series. This this bio is awesome there is so much so much in there that that i would like to talk about and i know we're not going to get to it all so welcome to our show and thank you very much for being here thanks for having me i'm so glad to be able to have both of you on here this is awesome yeah we always have a lot of fun having both of us because i'll go down one path and then he'll like bring it around and connect in now something else that you know we didn't quite touch on and back and forth so yes exactly well one of the questions we really like to start with our guests is what makes this a passion of yours what got you into speech and language besides connecting with that little girl like you said in your bio well i mean part of it with the little girl is that i see all the families that i work with as my family Like it's, there's a lot of vulnerability. They're really opening up their homes, their lives, their pasts a lot of times to me. And so I don't take that lightly at all. And part of that is because when I was growing up, both of my siblings had special abilities. They continue to have their special abilities. And there were a lot of people going in and out of our lives from doctors and therapists um, to different hobby people like coaches and things like that when my brother was in different sports and not all of them treated our family with the regard with the respect that I think would have been nice to have and I was very aware of that as I was growing up both of my parents are bilingual educators my dad was a basketball tennis and volleyball coach and so they were very much also interacting with people's families and they were supporting families so we could see both sides of it as we were experiencing it. And I could see when someone was actually being treated in a way that honors who they are, their culture, their language, their gifts, their capacities, and when that was kind of dismissed or put to the side and be like, this is my agenda. And I knew very early on that there's a that it creates more when you have someone that's actually looking at you and your family in a holistic way, because the very few people that did made such beautiful, impactful, lifelong changes for my individual siblings and myself and my family as a whole. That is beautiful. As a teacher of 27 years and having our own special needs son, I understand where you're coming from. We were got, we saw both sides of it as well. I was doing my best to be inclusive of all my families and talk with them and help them in the way that I could. And then when people came and worked with us for our family and our son, same kind of thing. So, yes. so quick question, were your siblings actually special needs? Because I was incredibly intelligent but i had like superpowers growing up and and it made me kind of very different and out of it so it, again that agenda so even though i wasn't special needs i was very different than all of the other kids with with the way that i looked at the world the way that i saw things and some of the things that i could do so was is was that the case yeah yes and no so my sister has spina bifida and um, she needed speech language therapy for stuttering, but she also had physical therapy and occupational therapy related to the stuff around spina bifida. And then my brother is hard of hearing. And so he needed speech therapy because of that. But he also had all these doctors and follow-ups because he was born with diaphragmatic hernia. And so he had a lot of different surgeries and follow-ups with that. But the reason why I say yes and no is because everyone else would say special needs for them. 
But when we had conversations as they were growing up, part of what I'm really grateful for my mom for facilitating is what would you like us to refer to this as? And my sister and my brother chose special abilities. And it's really been the lens that I see everything through. So as much as this reality and other people, and often I'm, I use special needs because I don't want to have to explain so much, but I really do see all of those as a gift, even, no matter what the labels are, the diagnoses, or if there's no diagnoses or no labels at all, it's really about pulling out what are those special abilities. And a lot of times it does come from these things that other people see as challenges or that initially were hardships that then they've been able to overcome or reframe in a way that it's actually something that they use to their advantage. Beautiful. Yes, absolutely. Love that. Because yeah, I mean, part of our life story is what gives us what we can't, what our abilities to introduce and be with other people so yeah it is not necessarily special needs it's special abilities what do you gain from having those challenges or what can you do moving forward yes that's beautiful well especially because there is a different way of connecting and of communicating and it doesn't mean that one way is better or not just like how you were saying herb that like you see the world differently well what is the what is the power in seeing the world differently like i'd love to be around people that do perceive things differently, do connect in a different way. I don't want everyone to connect the way I connect because then I want all of us to acknowledge that we're getting these different pieces in, from this whole big picture. And I want your piece to be fit into my piece. And so we can create a, create a bigger picture instead of being like, we have the same piece. We're not actually gonna get to create more. We're not actually gonna be able to see the whole picture. And I feel like over the course of my life, every single family, every single person I've gotten to work with gets, gives me another piece. And I'm, I haven't gotten the whole picture yet, but, you know, maybe by the time I die, I'll get a, most of it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, I, I grew up in a really small town in a logging community in the 80s. And so um, that time frame, people were different. The information was was way different. Mm -hmm. the, the vocabulary of, of energetic work, of under even understanding what that was, of being able to mm -hmm. see life in that way was was very frowned upon in a way because they, mm -hmm. they you know they kind of wanted you to fit in they wanted you in a box and so if you didn't then then there were there were lots of things that that kind of went wrong so yeah so yeah it, it would have been you know maybe easier if it had been visible for me <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah so yeah so that your kind of attitude Man, I would have loved to have met someone like you when I was a kid. That that totally really would have would have probably changed my life in some very beneficial ways. Well, and it's interesting you say that because I feel like when you're working with families, they might come to me with a concern about one child or two two or three of their kids, but then their parent, the parents, and I'm sure you guys have this as well with your work, is that they start realizing, oh, wow, as I'm talking to you, I, there's this longing, like you're, like, that's kind of what I'm perceiving with what you're saying. There's this longing, there's this ache for, I wish this information was out there when I was growing up, or I wish that I had found somebody like that. And so as you're working with them and you're empowering them, there's this aspect of healing that the parent goes through that then also then gets passed on to the kid so that the parents get to be stronger, get to be clear, get to get be unstuck and let go of some of the things that they've maybe unknowingly kept on mm -hmm. and were caring from their past experiences. Because a lot of my parents have their own different learning disabilities or ways of connecting themselves. And so they're like, oh, wow, I don't want my child to go through what I went through, or I'd like something better or more than what I went through. So let's how can we do that? And how can we create that together? And when they start seeing that show up, yes, it's like they are also their, their little girl that they were, their little boy that they were gets to get some of those healing going on and it just reverberates outward. And it's so beautiful. It is. I mean, when families actually start doing this learning and this progressing together and realizing that it can be different. It doesn't have to be like it was before, or they take the best mm -hmm. pieces of the past and put it with some new brand new pieces that are good for them at the same time. You're right. That blossom, that growing exactly what we want in our business and exactly what you want in your business. Did that happen with y'all with your son? When there are people working with your son, did it bring up stuff for you? Was there something where it made you think about your childhood or how you grew up in some way? Well, our children are, are in their 30s now, so um, 
even even when they were kids, the vocabulary was just starting out. Yeah. And so when my son was picked on in school, it kind of put me back into my own trauma. And I didn't still yeah. didn't know how to deal with it or to help him. And so that's that's kind of what we're doing now is because we made kind of a mess of things. But along the way, we learned a lot. And so what we're doing now is we're going to try and help people so that that they can avoid the messes that we got into. So we can sometimes when we're working with parents, we can see it's like, oh, you know, and, and like here you talked about going into psychology. It's like and like personality information. So many people don't have that. And if your child is an introvert and you're like wanting them to be like this extrovert and out there and you're trying to push them into that, that's going to that's going to have problems. You're mm-hmm. going. But but if they know that and you can teach them how to recharge and move into it a little at a time and then step back. And so just these tools that you can give to these kids to say, Hey, you know what? You're an introvert and this is how you can recharge. That's not how you're going to be, but it's a, it's a character that you can start to develop. Mm -hmm. But when, when it hits the fan, you know, you're going to revert back to your kind of core ways of being and that's being introvert. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. like, especially during the pandemic, when all the extroverted kids who were used to being in school and around all the people and glowing, when they had to come home and suddenly were alone all of the time, they and they started trouble. having their own problems because they didn't have the people around them that they needed to, to have that energizing way in their life, they mm-hmm. didn't understand that. And so they developed problems. So even just having a basic understanding of this stuff at a younger age, you don't have to be an expert, but just to know a little bit about it gives you the tools so when this stuff start happening you can you can maybe make yourself not so wrong oh uh, yes. make yourself not so bad it's like oh i'm i'm bad because of this or i'm wrong or i'm less than because i'm not like them but you you're yeah. not you're not them you're you and so to understand the psychologicalness of being you and then learning how to grow you and to be more of, of who you think you would like to be. I mean, that just just even that understanding is is so important to give to kids right now. And and I like the reciprocity of what you're talking about. It's there one of the things that that I'm hearing from what you're saying, and let me know if I if I've missed the mark here, is there's this piece of like like really being aware of what you're projecting from your past onto your kids or from your experiences onto your kids, but then also recognizing, yes, you're not who you were and they're not who you are now and you're not who they are. And so like really looking like, well, who are we right now? Like, what do we know? And so um, I love this piece of that you mentioned as well about not using this information to judge yourself. I think that's really, really important. Um, I was talking with Christina about this a little bit and how I love to talk and start with acknowledgement of what you know and what's going right, what's yeah. going well, because a lot of the people will come to me and they'll be like, "There, he's delayed in this, he's having issues with this, he's acting out here, he's did it in the whole laundry list. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, and breathe. <laughs> yes. And then I was like, okay, so we're gonna take all that, let's put it right here on the side for a second, and let's start with what do you know about your child? What do you know about your family that's working? Yeah, what is he doing and right? They, what is what yeah. is bringing you joy? What what are the good things? Yeah. And you feel their whole body go ah, and just melt a little bit. You're right? like, ah. because even the teachers, as as overloaded as they are, I work with a lot of schools around the country, and they are super overwhelmed. They're burnt out. Because they don't, they don't have as much time and resources as they should, they're often doing problem solving, problem solving, and so they're looking for the problems, and they're talking about the problems all the time instead of like, okay, this is going well with my students, and this is how I'm supporting them, and look at this progress that this person's made, and all these different things. So, And then it goes, and then they take it home, and then they're doing that with their relationships or with their families, and this is the problem, this is the problem, and they're just keep going and doing that. So one of the questions, because Christina was like, I want us to talk about what some of the questions that families can ask. Well, the first one I love to ask is, what do you know? What do you know about your kids? What do you know about your family? And what's working? What's going right? And literally, I have them write it down and really like sit with it. And I was like, when all this other stuff that, that we put over here on the side, 
we'll wants to be it. like the the monster that's like bigger and larger and like more scary and like yeah. making you go into all that. Remember this thing that we're looking at. Look at these things that are going well. And then how can we use this, these strengths, these gifts that you've acknowledged to work on this? Yes. And it's so much different to start from this, the acknowledgement piece, than everything that's lacking because it implies that you don't know anything about how to address the stuff that is delayed that's lacking that's missing out that's challenging right now it's like you know a lot you know so much let's start here and then it'll make this way easier and that small little pivot I think has these beautiful like rippling out effects mm -hmm. um it, I haven't met a family yet that when all of a sudden you shift their attention to the strengths and to the gifts it yeah. does it hasn't been beneficial to them like, have you noticed that as, as well with your work? Do you do that pivot to the strengths? I, that's, I, I seem to be the case when I talk to Christina about it a little bit. Yeah, it is. And it's definitely something we want to keep encouraging families is let, let's look at what is going well. What are the strengths? And even though you might have a diagnosis, even though you might have a label, it's not who you are or who that child is. It's information mm -hmm. to inform decisions to inform goals inform where you're heading or what like her was saying the personality might be the default but what can mm -hmm. you do to either grow out of that or change that if that's where you want to go so absolutely what you're saying let's look at the positive and use that good stuff to move forward yeah because how do you like doing that because i like having it with conversations and like depending on how the person learns like i also start with the parents because even if the child looks learns differently i since i'm working with the parents and caregivers yeah. i'm like how do you learn so i have to keep in mind how every person in the family learns and then be like okay let's let's bridge these gaps and be aware of hey when this is how you learn just mm -hmm. like herb was saying this is your introverted versus extroverted this is how you learn and then how does your brother learn and then how does your sister learn? And then how does your dad learn? And be aware of this and like, okay, are you able to adapt and shift? Because that's also part of the emotional intelligence piece as well. Yeah. And are you able to take that into account instead of being like, oh, they should be the way I do it. They should do it the my way. That's not really going to work. Absolutely. So how do you like, like having this conversation about strengths? Like when you're working with people? Um. Well, it's just, yeah. Oh, golly. I'm it, like, it, it more comes, we, we don't like have it like directly, but it just kind of arises because as they start talking about, again, most, if you're looking for a problem, you're going to be able to find a problem because, mm -hmm. and if you're concentrating on the problem and you're always focused on the problem, well, then they get bigger and it's, you have to, yeah, <laughs> because it's like, oh, what's wrong with me? It's like, well, you can always find something wrong with you, and if you, right. and it's like, well, what else is wrong with me? Well, what else is wrong with me? And if that's all mm -hmm. you're looking at, then, then your, then your energy goes down, your attitude goes down, so it's like, mm -hmm. so what is right with you? What is going right? What are things that you enjoy doing? How do you find joy in life? And so it's not quite as direct as the way you do it, but it, it, it's more of a natural, way that we talk that brings that around um i love it and yeah. i remember it's, it's more of a mindset a conversation are you a positive mindset are you a growth mindset that's where our conversation usually comes in because it's around academics and things so you know are you the person that oh i can't learn that or i can't learn that yet yet is one of my favorite words because it puts an extra spin on it that yeah things mm -hmm. might be difficult right now but they won't always be and i can always do something to move forward so yeah it's a mindset conversation and a little bit of my story is is i hurt my head and I messed up my emotional processing centers and I bankrupted a business because I couldn't make decisions. So there was a whole lot of things that went wrong. And I started focusing on all the things that went wrong and my life crashed. And I'm in recovery now. Um, I am working. I am doing the work to, to build my life, to grow myself out of the damage that I did to my head. And it is a process. It's, it's been a couple of years for me and I'm still working on it. So I'm sometimes able to take what I am doing and the work that I'm doing to be able to bring that back around and to help other people as well. So, so that, the that's walking kind of embodiment of the tools that you're inviting people to play with. Yeah, yes. exactly. So mm -hmm. one of the other things we kind of talked about, I remember this conversation is that we wanted to kind of drop some tidbits for our families of when might they need a speech pathologist? When might they need the feeding therapy like you were talking about? Let's shift a little bit and kind of go into there and help parents realize that, you know, if 
these issues are happening, this might be a key to unlocking it, or this might be the next step to look into. Can and you... what is feeding therapy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, where should I start? Do you want me to start with the communication or the feeding or? Let's go with the feeding because we've had some other okay. communication kind of people, but we you know, sure. want the input as well. But the feeding therapy is something we haven't really been able to talk with for our families. Okay, great. Because I do all the things. So um, <laughs> with feeding therapy, feeding therapy is therapy that addresses either the caloric intake, like how much nutritional input and um, are the child's taking in or the person's taking in, mm -hmm. and also the variety of what they're eating. So I, my specialty is more, even I've worked with those who have low caloric intake where they're not eating enough food. They have a variety, but they're not eating enough. I actually enjoy working more with those who have sensory-based feeding needs, which is ones where in any aspect of the senses, visually, they only eat like beige and brown and orange food perhaps, but no green and red and blue, yeah. which is developed yeah. later. There's a developmental continuum with feeding. Um, it could be that they don't, have certain textures so they don't eat anything mushy or they only um have crunchy food or they only have food that that is um that is crunchy in the beginning and then melts like chips versus a hard munchable that is like a carrot like a raw carrot is a hard munchable it doesn't just melt with saliva like a chip does right so i focus more on the those that have sensory based feeding needs and most of the feeding therapy with kids is play-based, which is so much fun. So then yeah. the carrot becomes either a tree or a log or a tigger jumping around, you know, <laughs> like on their plate and things like that. Um, and you really start seeing how people, how the different perceptions and beliefs that they have around food. I mean, for a lot of my families that come to me with feeding, it's life and death. Like the child is not getting enough food they, they're yeah. maybe at risk of being on an ng tube or a g tube or they were on an ng tube and g tube and they're trying to transition off of it mm -hmm. and they want to make sure that that transition goes smoothly that there's no aspiration that they're not getting any liquid in their lungs these different things so but my favorite part is you get to get a little peek into their cultural world because mm -hmm. food has such a cultural component Mm -hmm. So I, I worked in Chicago. This is where I started my career. And the first school I went, I was working in had 44 languages represented in the home languages, yeah. which I'm such a language geek. And so, I was like, <laughs> yeah. and so I was, I was talking in English to a lot of the families, but then they would split, go into the other languages and they would talk about their food. And then when I transitioned into early intervention, when I was working in the homes and I was doing feeding there, I'm at the table. Yeah. Talk about opening up your home I'm at the table. And they're like, hey, this is what we eat when we're in the Sudan. This is what we eat when we're in Iran. This is where we eat when we're in India. And, and I, families from all over. And I was working with them either in, in speech and language, feeding or both. Uh -huh. And they would talk about how they're really worried that they would have to do these other foods Mm -hmm. instead of the cultural foods oh, and wow. so this and because maybe the cultural foods are that texture that the kid doesn't like or the color okay. that the kid doesn't like or there these different that. things so how you bridge the gap so I I find that one of the barometers that I like using is check and see if there are 10 different starches that your child or the you because I find some adults now they're like I don't even meet this criteria come and okay. see me so there's 10 different starches. Let's so breads, carrots, chips, potatoes, those different things. And then do they have 10 different fruits and vegetables? So not 10 fruit, 10 vegetables, 10 fruits and vegetables total. Ideally, it would be 10 fruit and 10 vegetables, but let's start with there. And then 10 proteins. Okay. So that could be beans, avocados, but it could also be different meats. It can be cheeses, things like that. And if you looking at the list in detail and you're like, oh, I'm sitting with this. I'm let me over the course of the week, I'm writing down the different things that my child is eating or that I'm eating. Mm -hmm. I don't have that 10 of each in those each category. That's when you would want to get like a screening and a consultation about feeding. Okay. If you notice that they're not ever really eating the stuff that you are presenting to them, but you're not really sure how to present new things that might be more enticing or maybe they had foods that they used to eat and then they've gotten rid of it. 
and they don't eat them anymore. And it's not like it's just that one day or two days. It's like, absolutely not. There's something that shifted, yeah. especially after illnesses. Um, a lot of times that's a really common one because they have a negative association with that food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so they're like, no, 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 that food means pain or that food means we're going to the doctor or that food means that I'm going to have a stomach bug or, you know, my stomach's right. going to feel queasy. Yeah. So those are the ones that are like the easiest things to, to use as a guide to look into and see, okay, do we need to check into feeding a little bit more? I love that because a lot of our parents are like, oh, well, my kid will only eat this or my kid will only eat this. I mean, I had one family we worked with and the mom was like, oh yeah, he'll eat chicken nuggets and french fries. And that's all I can get him to eat. And it's like, maybe we need to look at nutrition a little bit more with this yeah. and try to get some help, right? Those kinds of things. Because it also has implications for learning. So I can see yep. how you'd also want to be, you know, Absolutely. supporting that and helping them have tools around that because- if they're not getting all of the vitamins and all the minerals and things like that, it it goes right to their brain and then it might make whatever learning challenges they already have even more of an uphill battle. Exactly. Yeah. And I was, I was horrible because I was a picky eater as a kid and green is not in my vocabulary. There are very <laughs> few green things that I like to eat. But so then as a mom trying to introduce that to my kids, it's mm-hmm. like, I know they need green, but I'm not eating green. So how in the world can I get them to eat it when I don't eat it? And yeah. yeah and it's I another like example green. of what we're talking about, how it brings yeah. up your stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So when we grew up, you know, I, I was, I'm a Gen Xer born 1970. So when I was growing up, it's like, if you didn't like the food that was put on the table, you just didn't eat. And Same. so mm-hmm. it, it got to the point where you would get hungry and you would eat. So sometimes when I see parents who who just like let the kids choose their own menus, that that just is like mind boggling to me. So because because it's like I, I never had even that, that option. Choice, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing that's happening right now that wasn't as prevalent the case when we were growing up was the number of allergies. Yes. There's so many more allergies and and in a very strong case. I mean, I had a kiddo, I was working with him in early intervention. I called him my boyfriend. My, the mom let me, I got, I got the green light because I just adored him so much. And yeah. um, he was one of the first kiddos I took on on my own privately and not through another company. Uh-huh. And it was, it was, very much like everyone else kept changing in his therapy, but I was the steady person and I wanted to be there through the whole process until he went into preschool and everything. And my mom and I are still in touch. I mean, this is now six years ago, seven years ago. And so maybe more, my time is pandemic threw off my whole time, but (laughs) he was getting eczema. He was getting rashes and to the point that he would be bleeding because he would scratch himself so much from the skin being so irritated and just inflamed. And the mom was a teenage mom and one of the most on it moms I've ever met. And unfortunately, because she was a teenage mom, she was getting dismissed and being ignored a lot by the doctors, but she kept pursuing it. She kept advocating. I'm super impressed with her. And she, we kept trying to get an allergy test and they wouldn't give him an allergy test. They were like, oh, you have to wait until they're in school age. Like it's too early. He was a year and a half, two years. Yeah. And he was having these rashes all the time and just miserable. She'd be basically giving him an oat bath to yeah. calm his skin down like all the time. Finally, after he had this almost bordering on anaphylactic shock level of response to something, yeah. they finally gave him the allergy test. And I kid you not, he was allergic to avocado, mm-hmm. oats, wheat, corn, every kind of starch. And, and they're Mexican. So they were eating this all the time. Grandma and grandpa were eating it. Abuelo and abuela were eating, giving yeah. it the tortillas and the and all the stuff. And it was everything that he was allergic to. He was allergic to also like berries. I mean, it was, it was so challenging to then find meals that right. he could have and not have a response. I mean, I have a really negative response, but we got really creative with it. Mom was determined and we were able to find different hodgepodge of stuff that could give him the calories and the nutritional density that he needed, all that. Now he's doing really, really well because over time, his immune system got a break from all of that super reactivity and his immune system improved. And then we could slowly start introducing some of these things over time. But it was very much this mom 
constantly being on it, on it, asking for what her child needed, knowing that what he needed and yeah. not letting it dissuade her that I was just like, it, she saved his life because I think he would have died with all of these allergies otherwise. Yeah. Wow. That is awesome. And we love it when parents step up like that. You know, they don't have to have the answers, but as long as they're persistent and keep asking to help get yeah. the answers, that's the best thing. And that's either food allergies, that's education, that's behavior issues. All of it is inter interconnected, right? So mm -hmm. along that line, we've both gone through complete elimination diets where we went down to the very, very basics of only Same. fresh meat, fresh fruit, fresh veggies, and then slowly start introducing things back. And it's amazing what happens, like you said, when your system gets cleared out and then your body can choose how it's going to react later if you reintroduce that. Yeah, I actually got down to the lion protocol where I was only eating beef. So for six months, eight, eight months, I, I just ate beef and salt and water. And that was the only thing that I would, and for the, I felt fabulous during that time. And then as I started adding some of these other things back, it, it wasn't quite so fabulous. And then I just kind of fell off and started eating just whatever. And then I really noticed it got unhealthy again and, and had to bring rain all that back in. So, so even though, you know, sometimes, you know, food is so addictive in, in our culture now, with yeah. some of the sugars and the way things are made, it's really hard to get away from, from these. The and bad so, things. Yeah. Well, and they spend so much money on the research to make it addictive. Yes. From the colors to the textures to the, 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 all the things that a lot of our kiddos, you were talking about the chicken nuggets and the French fries yeah. and the chips, they spend so much money on researching. These are the colors that are going to be attractive. Uh -huh. It's eaten earlier in the developmental continuum, the mm -hmm. oranges, browns, and beiges people eat those first. And yeah. then they start going into the other ones. And it was because as, as cavemen, those were safe. The ones yeah. that were the bright colors were usually poison, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's already in our biology there. But then on top of that, they want the kids to get really addicted to these chips and these really think these really easy, super processed foods. Yeah. And so they make it so that the kids don't even have to really chew a lot before it just goes whoop, and they just slide down their throat. And yeah. so for a lot of these are low tone kiddos, the ones that have kind of can't even keep their mouth closed, they might have like a little bit of a drool or like a, a droop down and things like that. Yeah. Or they don't really have a strong chew, they will default, they know what they're capable of. It's, it's right. very intelligent on their part, actually. So they'll be like, let me eat these things that are super easy for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not mad at them. I was like, I get it. Like, just like us, we sometimes will choose the things that are easiest. If we're overwhelmed, if we're stressed, we go to the easy. There's plenty of other things that are hard. And then when you get a chance to check in with yourself again, you're like, okay, now do I want to keep doing this? <laughs> right. Is this what I, like you were saying, oh, do I want to keep doing this? Or are we going to pivot back to what I know might create a little bit more and be more sustainable? Yeah. It's the same way with like preparing food we are in such a go 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 society it's easier yes. to grab something out of the fridge or out of the deli aisle or whatever instead of grabbing those fresh fruits and veggies and actually preparing a meal so families really need to be aware of that it's like how many days a week are you grabbing and going and how many days are you creating the time to yeah. get, get those really healthy wholesome foods and meals well and part of what i work on a lot with families this isn't typical feeding therapy but because i do the family and child coaching oftentimes they'll bring up this perfectly valid concern like i have soccer practices to go to and then taekwondo and then this one is in an art class and then i want to do my yoga class and like you know <laughs> where do i fit all this in and so we talk a lot about creative meal planning how it doesn't always have to be one day that all the cooking does for the whole week, it could be two days versus all seven and, and different ways of doing this. I love this show. Have you seen the show um, on Netflix called Nadia Eats? No, I haven't. Oh, there's Nadia Eats and Nadia Bakes. Um, okay. And Nadia Eats, it's N-A-D-I-Y-A is okay. her name. She's um, a, I want, I want to say she's Pakistani, but she's British too. Uh -huh. uh, I think Pakistani. And, um, but what she does is that she's has three kids. She's busy. She's on TV. She's doing all these different things. And she talks about yeah. these very simple, quick meals. And she's often working with uh, in this show as well, 
busy adults and busy families and how they can do meal planning in creative ways, considering their different possible um, foods that they like. And so uh, I, I love doing those. To, I was already doing that. And then one of my friends was like, oh, check out the show. You're going to get more ideas for your family. I was like, all right, great. And then you, you get to see these beautiful dishes of all the different types that she doesn't just use Pakistani meals either, but she, she does noodles and, and desserts and breakfast and lunch, all the different meals. And she does it in a way that you can then stack in, in your fridge or in your freezer and then just grab, and then you can empower the kids to do that. Like if you have teenagers, yeah. like, just have them warm it up. Yeah. And then I love having the kids. I started cooking. I don't know about y'all. I started cooking at like eight, nine years old. Yep. And, the and, and then I'm working with parents and I'm like, what do you, what do you mean your teenager isn't cooking? What do you mean he's not cleaning the bathroom? Like, how is this? Of course you're <laughs> overwhelmed. You've been doing this for 15 years. You should have had a break at least five years ago. What's going on? So like <laughs> delegate. <laughs> Cause then when they go and live on their own, they don't know how to do any of this stuff. So you're actually disempowering them. You realize that they're like, Oh, that's not what I'm trying to do. Right. And then we, different conversation <laughs> yeah that's actually a part of what we teach parents yeah. is to have them have the kids start doing some of the work teach them you know mm -hmm. get them out to change the tires but also you know balance a checkbook get them living yeah, yeah. skills how to cook how to clean because it's so you know, important kids are getting to college right now and are failing not because they can't do the schoolwork which a lot of them even now can't hardly write a sentence but yeah. the living on their own they can't do their laundry they don't clean their rooms mm -hmm. And so, you know, that that's something that that's that's why colleges right now are actually recruiting more from from homeschooled kids because they do have these living skills and are able to be a little more successful in college. I didn't realize that that was an increase because of that poll, but that does make sense. Um, it's interesting. It's it's really interesting that the change in that that's happened over the last couple of years. One mm -hmm. of the things, too, that I'm noticing is that was really helpful for me because even though we were empowered as siblings, my, my mom was always like, you're, I could die tomorrow. So you need to be able to cook. I can die right. tomorrow. So you need to be able to clean. I, it was so, and, and yeah. a lot of people were like, Oh my God, I can't believe your mom said that. Said that to you. Right. Yeah. Right. But for us, it wasn't fear based. It wasn't like she was creating fear in our world. It was very empowering, but also we used to have conversations about death from an early age. Cause my brother was basically born dead. Right. So there wasn't this like, oh, we can't, we have to deal with the fact that everyone's crying coming from Puerto Rico to see my brother right. in the hospital. We, went, we need to see the baby before he dies. That's how much everyone thought he was going to die. Wow. So this has been an ongoing conversation. So when she said, yeah, I could die tomorrow. So you need to be able to do this and this. It wasn't like, oh, no, mom's going to die. It was like, oh, I need to step up. It was the other side of it. Yeah. Um. So we all knew how to cook, clean, all the stuff, shop. We got the the checking accounts in in middle school when I when they did literacy financial literacy for me then right. my siblings after me started doing it at the same time, right. but one of the things that was really impactful for me even though I had these things is I was still people pleasing I was still trying to be everyone's best friend and yeah. the perfect daughter and all that, and I was doing so much for my friends I was doing so much for my family outside of those life skilly things yeah and then one of my mentors told me, you know what you're doing, right? And I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> and I knew I wasn't gonna like what he was what he was gonna say. I was like, right? okay. <laughs> so you're telling people the message that they're not capable when yes. you're doing all this stuff for them. Yes. I was mortified. I was hor I was like, oh that's not the message I want to send. I love them. They're so capable. I oh but I but that's what you're doing. Like as caregivers, as educators, as parents, when you're doing everything for the kid, mm -hmm. when you're doing everything for your partner and you're not letting them step up, when you're not empowering them and teaching them how and then scaffolding it back and fading away your support. Yep. You're telling them that they're not capable, they're not going to be able to do it. And I I suspect those listening to this do not want to send that message. Exactly. That is completely it. A lot of the people listening are exactly like that. Yeah. Have you heard the old adage that like um, bad times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create bad times. So we're kind of in that. Heard that. Really? Okay. So we're kind of in that with, with parents right now as well. So again, Gen Xers, um, we were the first, generation. we were the first generation where both parents really had to start going to work. Mm -hmm. So, 
So instead of the moms being home to, to teach the, the cooking and the cleaning, and then the dads on the weekends doing the other stuff, the, the tires, the, the yard, engine stuff with the yard stuff, work. Yeah. It's like we were kind of left alone and we're feral. That's, the, you know, the feral generation, the forgotten generation. And so it's like, oh, we're going to make things better for our kids. And so we didn't have them do the things we did. We, we tried to make things easier, but we didn't necessarily have good role models because, because they were both out of the home working all of the time. And so we made a lot of mistakes. And our kids are like, oh, we're going to make it even easier for our kids. And so what's happening now is it's like these yeah. kids – they haven't had to struggle. They haven't had to work. They haven't had to push. And now the parents don't know how the grandparents don't know how, and you got to go back several generations and, and yeah, they're not able to necessarily capable of, of pushing that information out anymore. So we went through the hard times and we tried to make it easier and easier and easier for our kids. And we kind of left out a lot of really important information and mm -hmm. So yeah, that, yeah. It, it's, it's kind of a, a generational shift. Not it was totally not intentional, but yeah. Well, right, I think that what you're saying, it. Herb, is true for like middle class and upper middle class. But for those that were in the lower socioeconomic classes, they've never had the option to not have two parents working or both parents working multiple jobs. And that's definitely been a lot more of my experience with the families that I work with. Is that that it's few and far in between for both parents to not be working. Um, I have also work with a lot of single parents, either single dads or single moms, be it from divorce or from death. Um, and so, or they, they were just never in the picture, you know, those types of things. Um, and so when that's the case, that's another dynamic to consider as well, where it's like, okay, how can you empower your kids and also create some more breathing room for yourself? Like you need to include your own self-care in the equation of your family. And I think a lot of parents are so busy either avoiding the conversations or making things easier for their kids that they don't realize how much they're making it so much harder on themselves and the kids are watching. And I, I was just talking to somebody earlier this week and they were. I was talking to them about how not only are the kids watching, but you're sending them a really not so great message about being an adult. Yes. Adulting looks miserable. <laughs> It looks like a horrible experience. Like I have a, I have a, a teenager I'm working with right now who he, re, I work with him online. He's in Georgia. I'm in North Carolina. Yeah. And he was like, could you please come to my graduation? It's like a big deal for him that he's going to graduate high school. And I was like, honey, tell me the dates, tell me the information. And one of the things that are happening with him though, is that he was like, I don't want to go and be an adult. He, right. he had, he's like, I'm, he told me, he's like, I'm really worried about graduating because then I have to be an adult. And being an adult sucks. And I was like, well, what sucks about it? We had a whole conversation yep. about it. And he was like, well, this and this. And I was like, but then there's also this part and this thing that are cool about being an adult. And But I get it because he's seeing his mom running around like a chicken with her head cut off. She's yep. always overwhelmed and tired. You know, it's a single mom. Um, he, you know, he's not seeing the examples of the fun in his world. Maybe he's seeing it on social media. The rich and famous people are traveling all the world. But when you as a parent, you're not being an embodiment of joy as an adult. They're like, I don't want that. Can I yeah. can I pass on that, please? Exactly. Yeah. Let's, let's try to avoid that one. Yeah. So we've always we've always both worked. All of our friends, both parents yeah. have worked. So we're we I don't really know any stay at home moms or parents. So that that hasn't really been our experience either. Yeah. Um well, we are actually working with the young gentleman as well. And he um, unfortunately just recently lost his mom and he mm. can't, he doesn't have the support. So we've stepped in as his support. And he said almost the exact same thing to us the other day. It's like, being an adult is stressful. I'm really, really stressed. And I'm like, why are you stressed? And he's like, well, because I had to make all these phone calls yesterday about car insurance. And we're like, sweetie. <laughs> That's only one little space, right? So we're trying to help him through that part of not being, feeling like he's so stressed out, learning all the stuff about his mom. Yeah. Well, that, and I said, how can you make making all those calls really fun? And how, right. and what about now you have car insurance for a car, yeah. but then you get to drive. Where do you want to drive it to? That would be really cool. Like, like, you're, like shift it back. 
Yep, he get, he get, he's had his own car now for about six weeks, and that part is just like totally opened up his world. He's like, wow. So yeah, it's totally such a freedom. That. I loved having a car, even if it was a beat up whack car. The first one right? I had, it was like freedom. Yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this has been such an awesome conversation. Is there anything that you had kind of on your list to talk about that we maybe didn't get to? How are we doing? Hmm. Um. Hmm. I think that I wanted to piggyback on something that Herb had said earlier about using the information and what you know, not to judge you. Yes. And one of the things that I really love that families should know about for both communication and feeding huh. is to know the, the developmental milestones. Like what's the typical development for both communication and feeding? And I, if you reach out to me, I, you can send me an email. I will send you some worksheets that just lay it all out. The motor development, speech development, um, feeding development, like what's the continuum? And then don't use it to be like, oh no, they're late or oh no, I've messed yes. up. It's like, oh, who do I need to talk to? What are things that I can do to support the skill then? Like that it's it's a way for you to start asking questions about what needs to be tweaked or added or removed so that you can start supporting those skills. So that was one thing I wanted to mention to the to make sure that the parents really know what's the typical development while also not having it be like where you tight fist it and it's rigid because even with those it's a range and there's people that are at the end and the beginning of that ranges and it fluctuates um and then the other thing that that we were talking about when it came to strengths earlier is going through all the different types of learning and strengths so maybe some people are more physical and some people like need that motor kinesthetic and some people are more visual I have a kiddo that need, if, if you're not touching on him or they're not getting touch cues for the sounds, it doesn't work. You can say it as many times as you need. He needs, he's a touch guy. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I learned that. And so really asking yourself, what is the way that this person learns best? What are the types of senses that needed to be supported for when it might be different than you as a parent and then using what you know to support them in, their, in whatever skills that you're trying to develop more. So Love it. That, that brought one back question to me that I had earlier is blue food. What are some blue foods? Because I, I know like blueberries and a couple of berries, but they're yeah. actually- Eggplants. Yeah, yeah, eggplants. Um, but some other blue ones. I actually have a color wheel that I use for my families. I can give them to you as a resource where basically we use this chart and I have the the proteins and the in the vegetables and the starches on the left and then the, the whole color trajectory from the- brown and orange all the way to the green. And we look under the blue if it's like, do you have any blue? So yes, blue, um, blueberries, blackberries would fall in there depending on how the level of ripeness. Um, I'm trying, I'm blanking right now. Do, do, do. Oh, you know how there's yogurts that are blue, like blue raspberry yogurts and things like that, yeah. popsicles, that would be a thing. Uh, la 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 la, hmm. Good, I'm yeah. glad I'm not the only one. I can't one think of any other one right now, but I'm sure there's more. <laughs> yeah, excellent. All right. So one more thing here. So a lot of families are like, oh, well, I gave it to my child two or three times and they just don't like it. They just won't even put it in their mouth. About how many times does food need to be introduced before it's a distinct yes or no? I know it can be variable, but. Yeah, I don't actually have a number. Um, okay. For me, it's a, it's not even about them putting in their mouth. So one of the things that is a misnomer that a lot of people don't realize with feeding is they think, it's presented, it goes right in the mouth. And there's so, there's a, a chart that I give them that yeah. it's like some kids don't even want it in their space or to smell it or then to touch it with one finger or to touch it with their whole hand. If they can't touch it with their hand, they're not going to touch it in their mouth. Okay. There's way more nerves. So I actually move them through more and more interaction. As long as they're interacting with it more and more each time, I keep presenting it. But okay. I also won't give them a whole plate full because I don't want to waste the food. So I might give them a little bit of a, of a bit to each time on the side of the things that they really prefer to have. And then I model interacting with them more, but I don't go from it's on your plate. It should be in your face. I go right into go and interact with them more. Let's smell it, smelling it. If they're not smelling it, they're not going to eat it. Right. So these different things, it's like, let's pretend the blueberry is a flower. And I pretend it's, oh, let's give it a kiss. If they can't kiss it, they're not chewing it. These yeah. different little steps. There's like 30 steps. Yeah. before eating it <laughs> uh, so that. as long as that's happening i think that's okay and keep presenting it 
Yeah, the little bit on the plate, we used to call that the no thank you portion. No Do you want you. some of this? No thank you. Okay, well, just a little bit. On your plate. Just so you can see it there. And also use the things that they do like to get them to try out and interact more with the things that are new or like more resistant to. So if they really like the chips, don't give them the whole chip bag, control okay. access, yeah. give them one or two. Oh, touch the blueberry. Okay. And then here's another one or two. Oh, give the blueberry a kiss. Okay. Here's another one or two of the chips. And then, and you see, and it's not, again, it's not on the plate to eating. It's like increase the play with it smash it <gasps> can you smash it okay and then you they get the other thing a little bit more but if they have a full plate of everything that they want already why in the world would they go right. and and jump over this hurdle because it is a hurdle to them yeah. for whatever reason yeah. to try this thing that they don't really want i love but it that you know they probably would be benefit from <laughs> I, I learned a lot today that that was really interesting thank you very much and the, it, it, the image that popped in my head is the picture of the baby in the high chair mushing everything up with their hands and everything mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying that's how they got used to everything and now we're giving it to them in a tube or a or a bottle or whatever instead of letting them actually interact with oh, it oh don't play with your food do we gotta wipe your hands don't mess oh don't touch that yes, and oh it's the worst when they wipe the hands please anyone who's listening do not wipe the hands with meal times with wipes that have smells like clorox or the okay. baby wipes it affects how the food then smells and tastes. It's gross. You don't want to yeah. eat baby wipes. I don't want to eat baby wipes. Don't use the baby wipes during mealtime. A perfectly good, a, a cloth that's with not. that's wet on one side with water and dry on the other side, half and half is perfectly fine. And let them get messy. I think they forget that, especially if they're developing these skills with feeding later. Yes. They think, oh, we can't get messy anymore. That was for the toddler years. No, that's what they need. And it's also play. Where's the joy in the food if it's like this serious thing where you go and you go and the, there's no fun in it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please tell our audience how they can find you, how they can get a hold of you to either ask another question or work with you? Please share your information with our audience. Well, my business is Empowering Light Language. So you can search that with my name and all the websites are probably be under here as well. My website is empoweringlightlanguage.com. I respond within 48 hours to emails. So if you email me at empoweringlightlanguage at gmail.com with any questions, I'll send you, if you want out some of these resources that I mentioned, I'll send those, those color wheels for the feeding or the developmental milestones there. It's just, you can go ahead. You don't have to be a part of my email list to receive that. Um, and yeah, I'm on, on most of the big platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. There's a lot of free videos that I have on my YouTube that you guys can check out and explore. But um, yeah, let's, if you want to have a chat, go ahead and reach out. Excellent. Thank you so very, very much. Ooh, you and Christina, I have that free nine page PDF that, that your families can download. Um, the link will be under here. It's being a different possibility for children. And it's basically a nine page little visual referent that gives you five tools that you can use so that kids can access their magic and their sense of joy as they're learning and being more successful. Love it. Love it. Love it. Absolutely. All the info, all of her information will be in the show notes. So make sure you click on that show notes and everything. Families, we hope you've enjoyed this. I know I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so very, very much. But go back and re-listen. Pick up those nuggets. Pick up those things that we sprinkled through here to help your family grow stronger and be happier and healthier and more successful in life. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sirius, for being with us. It has been a pleasure. And everybody, we will catch you next and time. Thank you for not finishing that question of what else I would like to talk to, because I would have loved to have got into her about the light language and, and how language goes. But we'll, we'll, we'll save that back. for the I'll next time, because back. that's I'll... a long conversation, too. I, mean, ah, I guess I'll have to come back. <laughs> Absolutely. We would love it. Have a wonderful day. All right, everybody. Bye for now.